Hi, I'm Vince Molinari, and welcome to FinTech TV's The Impact. Hi, I'm Kavita Gupta. We are very, very excited to bring this special edition to CNBC Africa today. Well, super honor as we talk about International Women's Day. And, you know, Kavita, in my household, it's Women's Day every day as I honor my mom, my wife, my daughters. And, you know, frankly, we get to celebrate you every day at work. So I, th I think we have to extend this to International Women's Month, year, decade. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Vince. And I think it was a very good reason when it started to remind people women exist, they're equal, they need importance, they need respect. But I think the ultimate society is when you don't need a day, <laughs> because that's every day, as you said. Um, I'm very excited today, Vince, to honor and celebrate a special woman in my life, somebody who has been an advisor, a mentor, and a real icon in her lifetime, Pat Mitchell. 35 times Emmy Award winning producer, news journalist. Imagine, uh, right? Uh, just imagine that. And then uh, somebody who being the only women president of PBS, CNN, and it's such an honor to have her on our platform at fintech.tv and doing this international series from her book, the dangerous women leading onward. Um, so today, uh, we're going to share uh, one of her special episodes where she is interviewing another path-breaking woman who has broken the glass ceiling, not in one country, one continent, but across the globe. Welcome to Dangerous Women Leading Onward. I'm Pat Mitchell, and this is powered by Fintech TV. Today's dangerous woman is exactly the kind of dangerous that challenges, that disrupts, that takes risk, and that ultimately brings about positive change. She speaks the truth when silence might be safer. She speaks up for herself and many other survivors of sexual abuse. And she speaks out against the racism that has defined so much of her life. She's brave, bold, beautiful, and immensely talented and much beloved for who she is on screen and off. Please welcome Tandy Newton. love what an absolutely beautiful and very generous introduction my darling <laughs> but it's absolutely true so i want to begin with my definition of dangerous as i just described it what's your definition of dangerous and does it feel comfortable as a description of yourself well <clears throat> for me personally and in the the wonderful position I'm in of being in my late 40s and being able to look back. And I don't think there are that many people, certainly women of color, who have spent 30 years plus in the film industry. Um, and I'm now at the point where I can look back almost dispassionately and things have happened, of course, but I'm able to see patterns. I'm able to see human behavior. I've been able to see what's happened to me and how, you know, when it how it relates to the rest of the world and other women. And I am so grateful to be in a position where for me, danger was the only option I had. Because if I wasn't prepared to put myself in danger that was only paled in comparison to the danger I found myself as a young woman in the film industry, a young black woman. And I almost feel it, the nature of what happened to me meant that I had to meet it with my own kind of fierce risk-taking. But honestly, Pat, for me, it, there was no option. It was simply survival. I have an innate need to understand truth. I have an innate need to discover the truth because regular truths, 
were not available to me as a child because I was not a stereotype. And I do think now, I was thinking about talking to you, and I think we're in a post-stereotype age. Nothing can be taken for granted anymore, nothing. I've lived it and we, can, we will, I'm sure, talk about that. But I have lived the fact that certainly when it comes to ethnicity and race, the idea of race, there are no stereotypes anymore. Everything has to be interrogated. And that is a glorious, that is a, a deeply exciting moment to be in. But it requires stepping into the unknown. And that is what we call danger. You know, but what I love about your... When I think about your brilliant book, Pat, and I think about your very brave decision to, to, to mention, there's the word danger with women, dangerous women, you know, is that we have to acquaint ourselves with the unknown. We have to acquaint ourselves with what we are terrified of, because very often that terror becomes the lesson we need in order to communicate with others. You know, we're a fear-based species. We are terrified. We are, we spend how many years do we spend needing to be taken care of by our mother? We're the only mammal like that. You know, we're terrified. So understanding danger from a human perspective is vital. It is our friend. And to be a dangerous woman in our time means to be a woman who is no longer willing to sit in the stereotype of what a woman, woman is. That is over. It is over. And it changes from one place to the next all over the world. And we need to be ready to include our entire human family in how we consider our humanity. That may be the most optimistic vision of where we're going that, that I've ever heard. But Tandy, let's, let's, un, let's I'm still alive. <laughs> no, let, let's unpack a couple of very big thoughts there that really do point the way onward. One of them is that, have we really moved into an era of truth after so much time in lies, deceptions, distortions of what reality and history um, in this country and around the world? And how do we move beyond the stereotypes, the yeah. cultural narratives that are instilling the fear and keeping us silent and giving us um, shaping our opinions of ourselves and others. How do we move towards that era you just described, the truth and the end of stereotyping? Absolutely. Well, I think one of the first and most important things is to remove the filters that have been placed in front of our experience from the moment we're born. You know, I had the great privilege of talking a little bit about that in my TED Talk, which is something that you, Pat, invited me um, to give, which was an absolute turning point in being able to crystallize some of my own personal ideas. But my skin color wasn't right. My hair wasn't right. My history wasn't right. Myself became defined by otherness, which meant that in that social world, I didn't really exist. The filters that are placed in front of our experience in front of our ability to receive information. You know, it is extraordinary when you think about how receptive and impressionable we are, certainly as infants, you know, what we are told that makes us feel safe, uh, seen, loved. And if we really look at those things and look about how our world is constructed by the place that we are in, it's, it's, it's things that we learn. Mm -hmm. And if we are truly invested in being part of this multi-spectrum humanity, we can't accept that everything we've been taught is truth. It may have been truth for our parents because it helped them, but is it truth for us? Is it truth for our children who are now on computers all the time, no longer hooked into a Victorian education system that really does them any good? What do we do about that? That's what I mean about everything has to be interrogated. And in the meantime, there needs to be tolerance and understanding because I think what we're, what's happening right now from a bird's eye view is there is resistance to change. And I mean murderous resistance to change because there is fear under it, fear of losing power. And power 
security is everything to each individual. The insecurity that Donald Trump might feel, okay? And that's on the scale of, we can't imagine with the power at his fingertips. But if that human being is desperately insecure and traumatized, that fear is gonna take over, isn't it? And it's going to feed the very thing that makes you more afraid and more trapped. The only way out of your fear is to go outside of yourself and to experience what makes you afraid, is to turn the light on, on everything. And I think having an understanding of that, but so that's the first thing is to remove the filters and to be present. And it's so much more difficult than than one thinks. We're all on this, you know, conveyor belt of needing to get things done. My goodness, earn a living. And we are stuck in a system that was not designed by ourselves and wasn't even designed by the people in power, right? Mm -hmm. But to go back to, you know, we, we all need power. So for a person who is, you know, unable to, to really have much control in their lives, that's all the power they have. So if, if alienating another group so that they can just cling on to this little bit of power is going to help, they'll do that, right? So it's looking yeah. at these, you know, looking at the system and how it, how it manipulates our fear. It manipulates our fear. And if we're afraid and we're told that things will be better, we will, we'll do what, you know, what we're asked to do. So I do think, I mean, and, and uh, when it comes down to, um, I think there are a lot of really important, there's a lot of important work being done now in, in trying to break down stereotypes or to rather to break down what we assume, you know, which has been handed down over generations. It is stale, come on, it's stale. Um, and when I, look at think, when I look at critical race theory, just the, the desire after civil rights to continue the complicated work of trying to address how this imagined uh, notion of, of a division between people who are dark-skinned and light-skinned, you know, which is, is so entrenched in, in the psyches of people, you know, we can't just like, I, I go around saying, but it's nonsense. It is nonsense. Race as a biological term is completely illusory. It is a hangover from colonialism, how to make two types of people more different from, from each other, use polar opposites, black and white, because this ain't black, right? I mean, I know it's so stupidly obvious. And then for a long time in my life, I would say it is crazy. So I'm not gonna to ascribe to it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give it oxygen. But the fact is race is this imagined idea that humans have hooked onto, it's become part of how some people will have more than others in a system. You know, it, 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 it benefits a lot of people. So it is a thing. Just because it isn't a thing, because it isn't, it's not real. Just because it isn't a thing. It's not just that I went to university and, and, and had the great pleasure of, of literally learning about how crazy this notion of race is. Um, that it has no biological standing, which was incredibly liberating for me. Um, but to go out into the world and recognize that it is so firmly entrenched, now that is a problem. That's a problem. And critical race theory, what's so glorious about it is that it helps to unpick these knots that are now in our world because there is no such thing as black and white. And yet we've made it, we've made it into a, an inc the thorniest bush in, in the consciousness of, of, of the United States and I guess the world. But the reason why not only am I, you know, academically, I understand it. I've lived it, Pat, yeah. I've lived it. In England, I am black. I grew up being dark skinned. I go to the United States, I sit with Tavis Smiley and I tell him, I refer to myself as dark skinned. He stops the interview to laugh about how absurd it is that I would describe myself as dark skinned when I'm light skinned. My experience as a black person, I've been to, I've been all over the world. Pat, you and I have been to Africa together. I'm called Mukiwa. I'm a white person, but listen to this. When I was in Mali on a, 
doing some 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 work there in the tradition in, in right out in the rural areas i was with a woman from senegal who was with me who was in Ter who was the translator and she was very dark skinned gorgeous like dark chocolate she was also mukiwa she was also white because white for them meant other i remember doing a movie in nigeria 5 years ago desperate to to be this character olana in half of the yellow sun. I applied for a job as a lecturer in the Department of Sociology and I got it. You must never behave as if your life belongs to a man. Oh God. Our relationship is the most important thing to me. We have to make the right decision for us. Knowing how much it meant to people in Nigeria, knowing how much it meant colorism and, and and the importance of showing the truth of our skin tone on on screen and could i really play this of course i could of course i could you know in one family there's any number of shades of skin right in if you're if you're if you're black um and then i would find myself in the market in nigeria thinking i looked so down not only was i nigerian looking i was nigerian 1968 looking like i'm like everybody knew i wasn't nigerian everybody and it what is that you know black and white i'm just other that's all it is and we will try and create otherness in others just to benefit and to try and assuage our fear and But we're afraid. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with our fear. Let's deal with our with, with the danger that we're in. Pat, that's what when you say, "I'm a dangerous woman," I applaud because yes, I know that with there is danger, and I'm willing to keep going, go forth into the danger. I'm not frightened anymore because I've had to deal with so many things that have questioned my not just my identity, my my humanity, my mortality. You know. So it's actually a relief, a relief to be just that little bit more fearless because I've also benefited so much from stepping out of my fear. I've had to. If people have been unkind to me, Pat, I can't leave it at that. If people have been unkind to me, especially around race or gender, I can't leave it at that. They haven't come to know me and I will keep going until they do. And then it changes and then it, you know, who knows what it turns into but we need to be present and we need to challenge these stereotypes we do and you have candy you have been fearless in coming forward and confronting the powers that be because as you say no one gives up power um <laughs> willingly and to challenge the power in the system in which you were working working from a very young age um, was incredibly risky. What led you to both come to terms yourself with your personal story, the experiences of racism, the experiences of sexual abuse? What gave you the strength to step forward, take the risk and confront the stereotypes, the powers, the lies, the deceptions? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that was really beneficial is that I didn't come from the industry. My dad's an antique dealer, my mother, a, a nurse and a healthcare worker from a very small town in, on the coast of England. We had one cinema, which would only show like the hits a year after everyone else had seen them up in London. Sometimes the Sometimes the reels would get down to us and they'd be so scrappy, Pat. We'd watch E.T. and it was practically falling apart, you know, because it would get to us so late. So that's my, where I grew up. And I had a passion for dance. Loved it. It was partly because it was the one place where I was free. You know, I got picked on by teachers particularly. I went to a, a Catholic boarding school. I was the only girl of colour. I think they saw it as like a missionary effort, honestly. Like I was a heathen that that they could help because I wasn't, I wasn't Catholic, so I really shouldn't have been going. But I think that added to my heathen quality, you know? And they picked on me, they bullied me. They made an example of me. Um, of course, at the time, I didn't know that. I just thought I was bad. Um, so all through my childhood, I was constantly being questioned about 
my validity, honestly. And the benefit of that is that I didn't have really much of an ego. I just didn't. And, you know, it was rough for a while, a couple of decades, because I was desperately shy, desperately shy, such low self-esteem, because I really had no esteem. Um, and that was tricky for a while because I was a very vulnerable young, young woman. And I've come to realize now as an, as an adult that I was 16 and brown at a time in the industry when there were very few, certainly internationally, you know, people who managed to work on the international, of course there was lots going on in Africa, movies and different parts of the world, but mainstream, this was an Australian movie. So I guess it was niche in its own way. But I was someone who was going to drop in. I'd never acted before. And I was just going to disappear, probably. And I think one of the things that's so key, and I'm so grateful and almost afraid of, because it is a, quite a responsibility, or I feel like I've got to do everything I can before I die to, to max out on this incredible vantage point I've had. Because no one thinks that a little brown girl is going to be around in a few decades, certainly not in the film business. And certainly not winning awards. Certainly not. Oh, no. Especially one who might speak out. Oh, she's gone. And I kind of was for a while. I still manage because there are good people who want to, you know, who don't want to exploit people sexually. So I did obviously, you know, I worked well. And I ended up not working with, with disgusting people because I would just call it out. I just couldn't do it. Like, why would I want to go through that? You know, and I think the reason is because it, and, and what's, what's important about not being in the business is that I didn't know the rules. I was a bit dangerous from the beginning, I guess, but I didn't realize why. And I didn't know that there are rules, Pat. And I came to learn those rules. And those rules were you just, you just zip it. Just keep quiet. Happens to everyone. Here's the thing. I could have stopped it from happening, possibly. But I was, I was a minor and it was not something that I could have stopped. So I wasn't versed, yes, it's called that's so interesting. I, I wasn't versed in the rules. So I just, I broke them because I just thought this is terrible. How could this possibly be allowed to happen? And, it, and I saw it happen to other people, even on that movie. And, and then I found myself in the industry seeing it happening to other people and re-happening to me, even though I would try and stop it. But I just thought, Whoa, no one knows this. And as soon as they know about it, they're going to be really shocked. No, 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 no. So because I didn't know about the industry, I didn't know that I was supposed to shut up. And I also didn't know that I wasn't allowed to. And I remember people saying, this is going to be career death for you. Mm -hmm. I had a publicist who told me it was bad for my reputation that I spoke about being sexually abused. And I... I knew my husband's very level-headed and he, you know, it, yes, it was bad for my reputation at the time because back then, 20 years ago, you didn't want to be associated with being a victim of sexual abuse because back then they could pretend that it only happened a little bit. Yeah. So if you shut up or if you're the only one, and my poor publicist was worried about me because she thought no one's going to want to work with you because you bring this bad karma. Hello, the bad karma's already there. I don't bring the bad karma. I call out the bad karma, you know? And it's still going on. Oh, I, right. I think that's where but we have not, to It'll always, that. always, it'll always, always be potentiated. But the difference is we can be awake to it, you know? And also, here's the other thing. It's not enough to just be asked to help. And I have been burnt by this. Bad, I, I've lost friends because I've spoken up, because I've seen what's happening to them. Or, and I just can't, I guess partly because of my own experience and I really wish people had been a bit more, taken more risks, Pat. Yeah, and been more supportive of you. Taken more out. risks. People yeah. only afterwards, people would say, oh, well done, you got away from that monster. I'm like, what, how? So uh, that's me. Yeah. I will speak out. I'll even 
But you've got to, be, you know, you've got to be careful because people have to be ready. That's the thing. This is the thing, you know. And I spoke to even my darling mother, who was devastated at the time when I would talk to the press because it wasn't really going anywhere, Pat. That was the other thing. It would never get picked up by anybody, you know. It should have done. I was crying for help, right? And my mother, my sweet mother, she she felt ashamed, of course, because there's me talking about this awful, you know crime that happened when I was a minor and where was my mother you know that's how she saw it yeah. and I remember when just after um me too really exploded this tidal wave of grief um and my mother felt the confidence to be angry on my behalf um about the people that didn't support me that I was the alone voice of course I wasn't a lone voice there were others speaking out but um and I very gently said to her, mum, you were one of those people. You were. It's hard. Change is hard. And I realize now, Pat, that it's the survivors who have to lead us out of here. More importantly, thank you for being fearless. Oh, for my speaking Thank truth. you. You have spoken truth to power in ways that very few have. And that is making a difference and it will continue to inspire others. So in all the ways, Andy, that your work, your life, uh, who you are in the world is leading all of us onward and forward to better times. Mm -hmm.